Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Martin Ralph. I'm a Regional Inspector of Mines with the Mine Safety Directorate here at Demers. And the topic for today is regulating exposures to naturally occurring radioactive materials, or NORM, in the WA mining industry. So let's start off by defining what is NORM. So in the mining industry, NORM refers to the primordial radionuclides, meaning they were born at the same time as the creation of the universe. And primarily we focus upon uranium, or the uranium-238 series, and thorium, the thorium-232 series. Now these radionuclides are naturally radio radioactive, but they are heavy metal toxins. And the two parent atoms, uranium-238 and thorium-232, will actually cause death by poisoning due to their heavy metal characteristics before they'll induce harm via radioactivity. However, both radionuclides consist of a series of decay products that follow on from their radioactive emissions, and it is these decay products that are important. So what I've done here is selected the decay series for uranium-238. And you can see what we mean by it is complex. There are 14 products that follow the decay of uranium-238 as mapped out in the diagram. And you'll notice that each of the radionuclides that follow uranium-238 are also radioactive and decay via alpha or beta emissions. Eventually, the decay series ends at the stable radionuclide lead 206. Now the important parameters around this decay series are what I'm going to highlight now. So what I've flashed up on the screen there is that there are five decay products that decay via alpha particle emission. This is very important because those alpha particles can be constituted into dusts and if inhaled can actually contribute to radiation exposures of the lung. It's also important to note that each of the products that decay via beta emissions are accompanied by a gamma ray. And gamma rays are like X-rays. They can actually create damage in the body from outside of the body, whereas the dusts will cause damage from inside. There's another complexity as well with the two decay series, and that is that it contains the noble gas radon. So radon-222 is important because it is a noble gas and it can escape from whatever mineral or ore body that uranium is hosted in. The most important part about radon is that it actually gives rise to a series of very short-lived, what we call radon progeny products. And these in themselves are extremely harmful if inhaled. And so we move into now on this graphic showing the way in which norms can actually expose workers to radiation. So the first I've said is via gamma radiation outside of the body. And the second two components are from the long-lived alpha particles in the dust and the radon and radon progeny um, that are inhaled in their own rights, both dust and the radon progeny will expose the deep lung. And over time, these three sources have been linked to some serious health effects in mining workforce. And according to Steinhausler in 1993, in the past, the mining and extraction industries have been associated with the highest individual occupational exposures to norm. And Steinhausler followed up by saying that there has been an excess of cancer incidents and or respiratory system illness observed in studies of mine workers around the world. This is why NORM is so important to be followed and regulated in the mining industry. So what about here in WA? How does NORM occur? Well, NORM occurs in trace concentrations in every rock and soil that's in the Earth's crust. But here in WA, we seem to be blessed with a little bit more of those norms than elsewhere around the world. For example, the Darling Scarp contains 10 times more radioactivity than the global crustal average. And WA's lithology is replete with minerals that contain either uranium-238 
or thorium-232, or a combination of both, as I'll demonstrate in the following graphic. So what we've got in this picture is the known areas where either uranium and or thorium occur. And you can see that there are 60 known potential uranium mines where the uranium is, is in sufficient concentrations to be mined in its own right. We are the world's largest mineral sands producer um, and mineral sands contain um, traces of uranium and thorium. The mineral monazite, which is highly um, elevated in both uranium and thorium. There are 47 known deposits in Western Australia. There are 10 known deposits of xenotheme, which is also um, elevated in uranium and thorium. And many of these deposits coincide with known base metal mines. As you can see, that strip that runs um, essentially from uh, Meningi in the northwest through the gold fields down towards Esperance. And also we have now the emerging industry of a tantalum and lithium. Where tantalum occurs, then there are elevated levels of uranium and thorium, but not as elevated as um, in the mineral sands industry. And furthermore, as the rare earths industry starts to develop, we're seeing the emergence of three provinces um, of real interest. The first is what I would describe as the Southeast Kimberley. The second is around the Esperance region. And the third and a very um, large amount of activity is occurring here around the Gascoigne region. So how do we regulate um, worker exposure to norms? Well, norm is covered in part 10.2, division three, subdivision 3B of the new WHS mines regulations. It applies a risk-based approach to um, regulating worker exposures and the disposal of radioactive waste. And the regulations defer to the Federal Australian Radiation Protection and Nuclear Security Authority guidance called RPS9, which is the Radiation Protection and Radioactive Waste Management in Mining and Mineral Processing. That way, by invoking that guideline, we actually end up with national standardisation of approach. RPS 9 sets uh, national limits. It also calls for those mine operations that have to comply with the regulations to produce radiation management plans, radioactive waste management plans, and the appointment of radiation safety officers, specialists in managing norm. So then what is radioactive material? Well, radioactive material is defined in the regulations and it is if the regulator designates a material in writing as being radioactive. But there is a physical definition of radioactive material as well. And that is if the radioactive concentration exceeds more than one becquerel per gram. Now that's a radiation term. So to put it into simpler terminology, um, that this is equivalent to 80 parts per million uranium or 240 parts per million, or a combination of the two. The concentrations are very easy to derive via chemical processes. It's a rule of thumb that we use, but um, please, it's a little bit more complex than that, but a good rule of thumb as a guide for whether a material is radioactive or not. Importantly, that one becquerel per gram uh, criteria applies to any part of the mining process, whether it is in the ore body, um, the mining process itself, or uh, as part of the tailing streams. All mineral sands products exceed the one becquerel alpha gram criteria. In particular, we're interested in the minerals monazite, xenotheme, and zircon. We're also aware that some operations that are pursuing rare earth or pegmatite hosted lithium minerals may also exceed the one becquerel alpha gram criteria. So, if a mining operation exceeds that one becquerel per gram, what happens? So we take a risk-based approach to the application of the radiation protection regulations. If minerals do exceed that one becquerel per gram, then we ask the question, what are worker doses likely to be? If a worker dose exceeds one millisievert per year, 
or if a dose to a member of the public who lives adjacent to the mining operations exceeds 0.5 millisieverts per year, then compliance with the regulations becomes a necessity. So the onus is then on the mine operator to demonstrate to the regulator, first of all, that radioactive materials are not encountered. Secondly, if they are encountered, that doses do not exceed one millisievert per year to workers, or that doses do not exceed 0.5 millisieverts per year to members of the public. That means that mining operators have to collect data to be able to demonstrate their case. And how do they go about that? Well, um, if subdivision 3B applies to mining operations, there is a host of requirements that need to be complied with. The first one is found in regulation 641M, and that is where a pre-operational radiation monitoring program has got to occur. Mining operations cannot commence without the collection of this pre-operational data, and that data has to be approved by the regulator. So recall that I said that uh, the Radiation Protection Series number nine, RPS9, the federal document applies. There are several clauses of that document that then get invoked. Clause 2.7.2 and 2.8.2 of RPS9 provides the content for the Radiation Management Plan and the Radioactive Waste Management Plan both of which must be submitted prior to operations commencing, and both of which must be approved by the regulator. And part of the approval process for the radiation management plan is the approval of a duly qualified and experienced radiation safety officer for NORM. The criteria for appointment of an RSO for NORM is found in Schedule 26 of the WHS Mines Regulations. But Essentially, they must have an undergraduate degree in a STEM subject and meet those other criteria in Schedule 26. This includes working under an approved radiation safety officer for a minimum of 12 months. Further, there are requirements for mining operations to be delineated into what is known as controlled and supervised areas to ensure that worker exposures are minimised. There is also the requirement to implement a representative radiation monitoring program of worker doses, as outlined in the radiation management plan. And that representative sampling will include personal monitoring of any worker whose dose is likely to exceed five millisieverts, and then what we would describe as a statistically significant sampling program of other workers, those that might not exceed five millisieverts per year. And those results of the monitoring must get submitted to the regulator. And currently the regulator requires an annual report of worker dose estimates. The regulations are supported by a series of guidelines that are known as the norm guidelines. There's 11 guidelines. Um, they've been around for a good many year and established mining operations are complying with the requirements of those guidelines now. But for new operators, the guidelines are available on the um, Demers website and two in particular I'd like to bring your attention to. The first is Norm Guideline 2.1, which describes the content and requirements of a radiation management plan for exploration operations. And there are many emerging explorers um, that will need to comply with the, uh, the, the new regulations. And the second guideline is Norm Guideline 3.1, which describes the content of a pre-operational monitoring plan uh, before operations can, um, can be commissioned. Furthermore, a final one that um, is required to be complied with once worker dose assessments um, start to be constructed is Norm Guideline V. This is based around dose assessment. It was published in May 2021. And the reason that this has so been uh, revised so recently is because the international authorities have increased the risk factors for exposure to radioactive materials. And so Norm V now reflects that international best practice. 
And importantly, for those operations under the Mine Safety Inspection Act who may have been exempt in the past from complying with mines regulations, because of this change in risk factors, your doses to workers may have increased as a result, and therefore the exemption may not apply into today's um, regulatory regime. Here's just a little graphic to show you what I mean by those changes in risk factors. So from the mid 1980s, a measure of how much radioactivity was allowed in the air, which is called the derived air concentration, was has collapsed from um, a number of 5,200 millibecquerels per cubic metre down to the current level of 500. That's a tenfold reduction in the amount of radioactivity that workers are allowed to breathe in in a year. That should signify how the risk factors have changed over the last 40 years. That brings to a close my presentation. Uh, if any further information is required, please contact the radiation protection team at Mine Safety. Um, you can come to me directly at martin.ralph at demers.wa.gov.au. If you require any further information, please go seek the norm guidelines on the web. Um, but if you need specific information, we have included links to um, RPS number nine, the RPANZA document, and the link to the latest in the norm guidelines, Norm V. So as usual, please stay in touch with Demers via our social media. Thank you very much.